let us continue from uh, where we left off. Uh, before the break, immediately before the break, I arrived at the expression for the total risk and I showed that there is one component of total risk which, which arises from individual variances, intrinsic variances of the securities which tends to 0 as we diversify more and more. Uh, gradually as we diversify, this particular component of the risk tends to 0. However, there is another component which does not uh, tend to 0 or which is not completely eliminated by uh, even infinite diversification. Even if you di diversify totally, uh, the this component of risk does not vanish, it still makes a finite contribution to total risk. And therefore, uh, the total risk even in the event of infinite diversification tends to a finite value which is non-zero. This was one uh, inference that I drew just now and the second inference that was I drew was that the component of risk that uh, diversifies to 0 uh, arises from the intrinsic variances and the component of risk that does not diversify to 0 arises out of mutual interactions. In other words, it is the mutual interactions between the securities that gives rise to the systematic risk. Uh, now, the learners may consider, as you may find this particular inference a bit of a, a contradiction to what we discussed in the context of the single index model. So, I, I need to clarify this point. When I am talking about mutual interactions uh, in the general situation, uh, it is without reference to the single index model. But however, when you move from the general framework into the single index model, what we find is that these mutual interactions are are modeled completely by, by the relationships of the securities with the market index and we do not have any direct mutual interactions within the premise of the single index model. So, therefore, the, the expression that represented the systematic risk that arose from mutual interactions is now captured by the term that represents the re interrelationship of the securities with the market index that was beta p square sigma m square. Uh, so, let me repeat the covariance term that does not uh, tend to 0 e even in infinite diversification that uh, tends gives you a finite value, non-zero value for the risk is modeled in the single index model as being uh, as arising due to interactions between individual securities with the market index uh, separately and the single index model forbids any mutual interactions in the sense that the two securities interact directly with each other. This is a clarification I thought it, uh, I need to give because uh, apparently the results seem to be conflicting. So, uh, but please note in the last derivation before the break, we never assumed the validity of the single index model. So, uh, if we feed in the single index model into that derivation, we will find that the systematic risk component arises from interactions of each security with the market index rather than direct mutual interactions between securities. And the reason uh, as I have emphasized again and again that securities move uh, uh, together or move in tandem with each other is due to their relationship with the market index rather than any direct relationship with each other. Because because we have assumed uh, in the single index model that uh, expected value of E i E j is equal to 0. This uh, is the mathematical representation of the assumption that I have just explained. Now, we move on to portfolio optimization in the single index model. Uh, I mentioned at the outset at the time of introducing this model that the fundamental objective of the single index model was to simplify the portfolio optimization process. So, let us see how this is being achieved under the single index model. We derive the simple ranking device when the investor is allowed, we shall explore two situations. Firstly, when short sales in the securities are allowed and the second situation when short sales are not allowed. We will illustrate them with examples. So, first of all, let us take the situation where short sales are allowed, which is rather simple. We derive the simple ranking device when the investor is allowed to short sell securities where he wishes to act as if the single index model adequately reflects the correlation structure between securities. 
Now, we, we have this equation which uh, we have discussed in a lot of detail in the mean variance framework. Uh, this is the optimization equation, the fundamental optimize equation, optimizing equation when we talk about the mean variance framework. So, if the investor wishes to assume a riskless lending and borrowing rate, that means we are also allowing riskless lending and borrowing within this model. So, we are allowing riskless lending and borrowing together with short selling of the risky securities. Then you can obtain an optimum portfolio by solving a system of simultaneous equation given by equation number 10. These are this is a set of n equations in n unknowns z1 and z2, z3, so on up to zn, and hence we can find a unique solution. Now, let us quickly recall the single index model. The equations are uh, given on the slide the expression for the expected return on a security, the expression for the variance of a security, the expression for the covariance, the uh, expression for the expected return on a portfolio and then the expected expression for the variance of a portfolio. All these expressions we have discussed uh, in detail and this is only a summary of the results that we have already obtained. Now, substituting these relationships that hold for the single index model into the general equation uh, 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 general system of simultaneous equations excuse me what we get is equation number 11. When we substitute uh, um, equation number let me go back equation number 6 when we substitute equation number 6 in equation number 10, what we get is equation number 1. Sigma i square is replaced by beta i square sigma m square plus sigma e i square and the covariance term sigma i j is replaced by beta i beta j sigma m square which is equation number 7. And uh, this uh, now, here we are uh, injecting the single index model into our analysis. Let us see what we get from here. Uh, now, this is equation number 11 that I brought forward from the previous slide. Let us look at the summation term. Uh, you know, if you look at the summation term, let us it contains the caveat, it contains the constraint that j should not be equal to i. In other words, the summation should be with all values of j except the value of i. Uh, the summation does not extend or does not include the term for which j is equal to i. Let us explore what k, what we get uh, when we substitute j equal to i. When we substitute j equal to i, what we get is z i beta i square sigma m square. If you substitute j equal to i in the term within the summation, you get z i beta i square sigma m square. And please note, this is the first term on the uh, right hand side of the equation that is the term that I am underlined in equation number 11. I, in other words, let me repeat what I have done. If uh, this uh, summation uh, extends over all values of j except the value j equal to i, that is what the summation term represents. Now, if in this summation term I was to remove this constraint, in other words, if I was to allow j is equal to i in this particular summation. Then that means, uh, the additional term that would come into the picture that would come into the summation would be the term for which j is equal to i. And what is that term? That term is z i beta i square sigma m square, but that is nothing but the term that I have underlined that is the first term on the right hand side. So, in other words, what I can do is to simplify it. Let us say it is a case of simplifying the notation. What I can simply do is I can incorporate this underlying term within the summation and remove the constraint j unequal to i. Because by incorporating or by removing the constraint j unequal to i, I will allow for j equal to i. And the term that I get on j equal to i is simply the first term or the underlying term in equation number 1. So, the bottom line is if I remove the constraint j equal to i, then I need not write the first term, the underlying term separately. It automatically gets embedded in the uh, summation term. So, let us rewrite that equation by making this uh, changes of notation that gives me equation number 12. Now, in equation number 12, uh, 
what do we have? We have expressions for uh, z i. So, we can solve for z i. If we solve for z i, what we get is the next equation that is right at the bottom of your slide. See, we have simply solved equation number 12 for z i made making appropriate transpositions and we get the next equation at the bottom of your slide. What we have is z i is equal to this uh, r i bar minus r f upon sigma e i square minus beta i sigma m square upon sigma e i square summation z j beta j. Now, you can write this in a slightly more helpful form, slightly more convenient form by taking beta i upon sigma i square as a prefactor and within the square brackets we have r i minus r f upon beta i that represents the first term uh, and minus c star where c star is nothing but c star is nothing but sigma m square summation z j beta j the value or the appropriateness of writing this equation in this form in, e in the form of equation number 14 will be become apparent very soon. Now, we have to we do not know the term that we do not know in this uh, equation number 14 is the summation term summation z j beta j. So, we have to somehow uh, express the summation z j beta j in terms of the inputs that are available with us. We do it in a very exquisite manner. What we do is we multiply uh, this equation z i is equal to r i bar minus r f upon sigma e i square minus beta i sigma m square sigma e i square summation z j beta j. We multiply it by beta i and then we sum over all values of i. We, I repeat, we multiply this equation by beta i and we sum over all values of i. What we get is summation z i beta i is equal to the expression that is on the right hand side. I repeat, we have simply multiplied this equation by um, beta i and we have summed over all values of i. Now, if you look at this equation which I am again underlining, what we find is that there is summation z j beta j on the right hand side and there is summation z i beta i on the left hand side. In both cases, the summation index runs from uh, 1 equal to 1 to n, I am sorry. So, in both cases, uh, we have summation z beta uh, summed over all values from 1 to n. So, obviously, these two terms would be the same. The only thing is the, the naming of the index. In one case, it is i, the other, in other case, it is j. The summing range is the same and the term that is to be summed over is also the same in both cases. In other words, what I am saying is summation z i beta i is equal to summation z j beta j. In each case, the summing is over uh, 1 to n. So, I can take this, I can solve this equation, the equation that I have underlined for summation z j beta j or z i beta i, you can take any index, you can take k, a, b, j, whatever and what we have is equation number 16. In other words, summation z j beta j or summation z i beta i is given by the right hand side of equation number 16. This enables us to immediately work out the value of c star. So, c star is equal to summation uh, sorry sigma m square summation z j beta j and which takes the form of equation number 17. Having worked out the value of c star in terms of the known parameters, we are now in a position to work out each value of z i and then normalize this to obtain the values of x i, x 1, x 2, x 3 which form the composition vector of the optimal portfolio. So, that is the optimization process in the case where short sales are allowed together with risk free lending and borrowing in the single index model. Uh, so, you can see how simple this process has become by incorporating the assumptions of the single index model. And let us look at a example. So, case 1 when short sales are allowed, the relevant data in respect of 10 securities is tabulated on the next slide. 
we take R f equal to 5 percent and we assume that sigma m square that is the market variance is equal to 10 percentage square. And we illustrate the construction of the optimal portfolio when short sales are allowed and risk free lending and borrowing is also allowed. So, this is the data that is given to us uh, uh, up to up to column number uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and from the information that is contained in column number number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we can work out the excess return that is column 6 and we can work out the other parameters as well. Uh, we can work out the excess return per uh, unit of systematic risk and we can work out other expressions which are required we, for the calculation of C star. What are the inputs that are required for C star that are given in this slide? Sigma m square is required which in our case is known it is uh, 10 R f is given as 5 summation of R i minus R f beta i upon sigma E i square. Uh, this is all this is given in the table. Uh, you have to sum over all possible securities or all given securities in our case and what we get here is if you look at this, this is equal to 44.1 divided by 10 that is equal to 4.41. What else is required? Uh, we need summation of beta i square upon sigma e i square, summation over all possible values of i which can also be obtained from the index uh, from the table I am sorry and that is equal to 87.625 divided by 100 that is equal to 0 0.87625. And so, we can work out the value of c star, we have got all the inputs here, we find that c star is equal to 4.52. Knowing the value of C star, we can directly work out the values of Z1 to Z10, uh, which is uh, uh, which is given in the next slide. And knowing the value of Z1 to Z10, we can work out the corresponding values of X1, X2, X3 up to X10 by using equation number 14. So the results are tabulated in this slide. Uh, we have uh, Z1 is equal to, for example. Mm, it is given beta 1 upon sigma E 1 square into R 1 minus R f upon beta 1 minus C star where C star is equal to 4.52. When you substitute all these values for security number 1, what we get is that Z 1 is equal to 0 0.110 and similarly you can work out all the other values of Z. So, this is how the case where short sales in the securities are allowed together with riskless lending and borrowing uh, has to be handled within the domain of the single index model. Now, we look at the second case where short sales are not allowed. The process is slightly more involved. So, let us go through it step by step. The first step is that we arrange all the given securities in the order of decreasing R i bar minus R f upon beta i. I repeat, we arrange all the given securities in the order of decreasing R i bar minus R f upon bit. In the previous case, when short sales was allowed, this order need not be maintained. You had no need to arrange the securities in this descending order as per by this parameter. Why? Because we, we were summing over all the securities in the portfolio. Some could be long, some could be short. We were allowed short sales and therefore, uh, we could take negative values of x's also. And that meant that meant that there was no need to organize the securities, align these securities in the order of this decreasing value of the excess return to beta. Then for after organizing them or after aligning them in the order of decreasing R i minus R f upon beta i, we calculate C i for each security by including by including that security and all securities above them in the in the feasible set or in the uh, optimal portfolio. Let us say we assume that only the security with the highest R i bar minus R f upon beta i is contained in the portfolio. Then we work out C i on the premise that this one security alone uh, is uh, in a portfolio and we work out the value of C i. Similarly, if we assume that security 1 and security 2 
uh, as per the ranking uh, are going to form the portfolio, we again work out the value of C i, but this time on the premise that the portfolio consists of two securities. Similarly, uh, we work out the value of C i that is C 3. Uh, on the present premise that the security 1, 2 and 3 in the ranking is included in the portfolio. So, we work this out for all the 10 securities, all the n securities in our portfolio. We work out C 1, C 2, C 3, C 4, where each C i is based on the premise that that particular security is for example, if it is C 4, then security number 4 and all securities lying above it in the ranking would be included in the portfolio. If we are working out security 6, that means what? That means, all securities including security 6 as per the ranking would form the portfolio. If we are working out C 10, we assume that the our portfolio consists of all the securities and we work out C 10 accordingly. We then compare the all the C i's that is C 1, C 2, C 3 that we have worked out with the values, the corresponding values of R i minus R f upon beta i. So, the next step I repeat, uh, we have got all the values of C i, we compare these values of C i with the corresponding values of R i minus R f upon beta i and we locate that value of C i such that below which, below that value, say uh, below that value what happens is that the value of C i becomes greater than the value of R i minus R f upon beta i. That means, up to the values of C i above and including that security, the value of R i minus R f upon beta i will be greater than the C i that we have worked out. So, that is the cut of C i, we call it C star. And based on the C star, the rest of the process uh, resembles absolutely the steps that we followed in the previous example when short sales were allowed, except for the fact that here securities which are giving a negative x uh, will not be included in the portfolio because you are not allowing short sales. So, only up to that security at the point of which we have C star would form part of the optimal portfolio. Uh, securities below that C star level will not form part of the optimal portfolio. So, now let me illustrate this with an example. So, we have got it 10 securities here and the first step is that we have ranked these securities in terms of R i minus R f upon beta i. You can see here that R i minus R f upon beta i is decreasing as we go along this particular uh, column 10, 8, 7, 6, 6, 4, 3, 2.5, 2, 1. So, it is decreasing as we go along this particular column downwards. In other words, we have ranked these securities in the order of decreasing R i minus R f upon beta i. The next step is we calculate C 1 on the premise that we have only one security, uh, security number 1 in our portfolio, we calculate C 1. Then we calculate C 2, C 2 is worked out on what premise? On the premise that security number 1 and security number 2 form our portfolio, the values of the various parameters are worked out accordingly and the value of C 2 is worked out. We will take only these two values here and these two values here, uh, uh, I am sorry, the summation is already done. So, we shall take only this value here and this value here for the purposes of working out C 2. And when we work out C 3, what will we do? We will assume that our portfolio consists of only 3 securities 1, 2 and 3 and therefore, we will use the values that are given here 10 by 10 and 12.625 by 100 when we work out the value of C 3. Similarly, for C 4, we will use the values 34 by 10 and 52.625 divided by 100 when we work out the value of C 4. Similarly, for C 5, C 6, C 7, C 8 and C 9 and C 10. Now, we compare the last column with the second column. What do we find? We find that 
it is at the point number 5 that is the fifth security that beyond which that below which we find that the value of R i minus R f upon beta i is less than the value of the corresponding C i. You can see for security 6 R i minus R f upon beta is equal to 4, but C 6 is equal to 5.30 and let us look at uh, Mm, for security 5, what we find is R i minus R f upon beta is equal to 6, but C i is equal to 5.45. So, C 5 is the cutoff point, because th at that point the it is the last value for which R i minus R f upon beta i is greater than C i. Below this for all values R i minus R f upon beta i is less than uh, the corresponding C i and therefore, we uh, C 5 for, forms our cutoff. What is C 5? C 5 is 5.45. So, the cutoff value of uh, for our purpose, the value of C star for our purpose works out to 5.45. The rest is easy. We have the value of 5.45, we work out the value of z1, z2, z3, z4 and z5 as we did in the earlier case. Here we will stop at z5, we will not go beyond z5 because beyond z5 if you if you look carefully we will get a negative value and therefore, you cannot consider that negative value, you are not allowed to consider that negative value. There is a correction here, I am sorry, this is 5.45. Okay. Now, we move on to the capital asset pricing model. Now, we have talked about the single index model. As I mentioned at the beginning, the single index model is an empirical model. It is an empirical uh, regression based best fit model. It is a model where we simply do a statistical fitting of a, of a straight line or a regression line in our data and on that premise we work out certain uh, simplifications in the portfolio optimization process and other information that we can extract about the portfolio. And the second thing is that the model does make some radical assumptions which may not hold in practice. The third thing is that we do not have an uh, underlying finance theory which justifies, which vindicates, which supports the assumptions that are fed into the single index model. The assumptions are rather empirical, rather a priori and on those basis we have arrived at certain results which nonetheless are useful. The capital asset pricing model is also a single parameter model, but it is uh, or a single factor model rather, but it is much more. Uh, rational in the sense that it has a finance theory behind it, a finance basis behind it. It has a, a useful, uh, a, a, uh, justifiable uh, logic uh, attached to it on the basis of which certain results have been obtained. So, let us, uh, let us at least introduce this in today's class. You see, this, uh, as I mentioned just now, the single index model is an empirical description of st stock returns. You do some regressions using data and you come up with alphas and betas for the securities and the portfolios of those securities. That is all. It is useful to for example, in modeling risk in a bunch of securities in a simple way. However, the capital asset pricing model as I explained has a sound rational to it. It has certain certain assumptions on the basis on the behavior of the investors and the market as a whole. So this CAPM model is an economic theory that lays alpha or that states or that proves and that establishes that alpha in the long run has an expected value of zero, which means that the returns investors get on are solely due to their exposure to the market factor. It is an equilibrium model. The, uh, the CAPM model is an equilibrium model based on a set of assumptions about investor and market behavior. This is justified by some reasoning like 
other risks can be diversified away. So, they will not be rewarded in equilibrium, only systematic risk will be rewarded. So, this there is a rational, uh, there is a finance sense attached to or embedded in the capital asset pricing model. Uh, we shall continue from here in the next lecture. Thank you.